Hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome to the program. This is The Other People Show. I'm Brad Listy in Los Angeles. Thank you for listening. I have a great episode for you today. I have another flashback. It's Friday. I have been doing flashback episodes on Fridays for the past several weeks and the tradition continues today with an outtake from episode 419, my conversation with Viet Tan Nguyen. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, whatever remains of Twitter, and Blue Sky. I just started another people account on Blue Sky, so follow the show there if you are a Blue Sky person. Before we get started, a quick reminder that I do a weekly email newsletter. It is free. I would love it if you would sign up for my newsletter. Subscribe over at bradlesty.com or otherppl.com. It's pretty straightforward. I will let you know about the latest episodes each week. I also share links to things that I've been reading and finding interesting. So if you want to hear from me in your inbox once a week, go sign up for the newsletter. As well, I would love it if you would join the Other People Patreon community and support this show, help keep it rolling. It is a sliding scale, and as you move up the scale, you can get merchandise. So check that out over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. So once again, I'm going to be doing a flashback today to episode 419, which first aired on June 22nd, 2016. You can listen to the full episode if you so desire. So if you like what you hear in this flashback episode and you want to go in for the full conversation, please know that you can do so. Episode 419 is there for the taking. All episodes of this show are accessible, so have at it. So today, once again, you're going to hear me in conversation with Viet Tan Nguyen, whose novel, The Sympathizer, was a New York Times bestseller, and it received the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2016. It received a lot of awards and honors, including the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, the Edgar Award for Best First Novel from the Mystery Writers of America, the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction from the American Library Association, the First Novel Prize from the Center for Fiction, a gold medal in First Fiction from the California Book Awards, and the Asian Pacific American Literature Award from the Asian Pacific... American Librarian Association. How's that for a run of success? Viet Thanh Nguyen's other books include Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam, and The Memory of War, a work of nonfiction, a finalist for the National Book Award in nonfiction, and the National Book Critics Circle Award in general nonfiction. He is also the author of Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America. He is a professor at the University of Southern California, professor of English, American studies, and ethnicity and comparative literature. And his next book is called A Man of Two Faces, a memoir, a history, a memorial, which is forthcoming this October from Grove Press. So it is fun to revisit this conversation from episode 419 Again, it first aired on June 22nd, 2016. Here I am with Pulitzer Prize winner, Viet Thanh Nguyen. Absolutely. I mean, I've been shaped by history, and I grew up at a very young age knowing that there was that history, and not fully understanding it, but beginning it by you know, intuitively before I was 10, explicitly by the time I was 10, and uh, absorbing this kind of information through family stories, family experiences, and then starting to watch American uh, movies and reading American books and reading American histories, American magazines. And so I knew that I was a refugee from this war, and it's something that it's important to insist on today because I think there's a tendency on the American readership to talk about this novel as an immigrant novel because that's just the... That's a part of the American dream and American culture. We think of immigrants, but there's a real important distinction between immigrants and refugees yeah. that I have to draw on. And, you know, one of, the, one of the important distinctions is because a lot of refugees are here because of war. A lot of immigrants are here because of war, too. But again, that's another thing that Americans tend to forget. Yeah. Well, and how did you have like a visceral memory of, of being told that? Like, do you remember when somebody told you that this is what happened? 
I'm trying to remember if there was a, a singular incident, you know, but the 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 one that I obviously you know have talked about and remember is watching Apocalypse Now when I was ten years old, and and that that's early to watch Apocalypse Now. I guess I was precocious, <laughs> you know, but there was this newfangled invention called the VCR, and we got one relatively early on, probably around nineteen eighty nineteen eighty or so, and and I'd seen you know what was available. There wasn't that much available. You go to the video store and it was like on a couple of shelves with the videotapes that were there. So after watching Star Wars a dozen times, got to Apocalypse Now, which is actually sort of a related film. And that was, I think, my first narrative exposure to the Vietnam War outside of the fragments of memory that were circulating in the family and the, and the Vietnamese refugee community. And that was a narrative that I realized that I was both excited by as a spectator, as an American spectator, an American boy watching a war film, but also a narrative that shut me out. You know, that narrative in which people like me existed only to be killed or spoken for, to be mourned. And that I knew that that was not enough. And, and eventually by 20, I knew that I'd have to do something about that. Well, the, and you parody Apocalypse Now or like films like it. It seems like an Apocalypse Now parody in the book. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as you say, many other films as well. Yeah. I mean, like I think of Oliver Stone. I mean, there's the popular, uh, like, you know, quote unquote, mainstream Vietnam War films of my youth and of the past several decades. Are there any of them that you like? I sure you like Apocalypse Now. I, I mean, I like a platoon. I like Full Metal Jacket. A number of these films are really good artistically. I, re I respect them technically, and I respect them if I were to shut off the part of my brain that is the Vietnamese part that says, wait a minute, what mm. happened to the Vietnamese people? But I can't. So then, of course, I have to be critical of them for that reason. And I have to feel that you know the novel itself is meant to engage with these works of art and as, as, I, as I think all works of art should you know we as writers we should be responding to things that come before and, and we should both respect them and also you know point out where they fail and I think that's one of the jobs that the sympathizer does yeah no I know it does and and I think that um you see this so often where I take a film like Dances with Wolves where there's a white protagonist in a Native American world or you have the white person in Africa or you ha it's always the white perspective and it's white people making these films, which is no accident. Absolutely. I mean, obviously it still happens today on TV shows, remakes, all this kind of stuff. And so it's an enduring part of Hollywood as an industry. But although, you know, Hollywood is a very unique kind of thing and it's easily mocked and satirized, I think it's it also needs to be taken seriously. I mean, I think it's it's the, what it does in terms of erasing and effacing people of color from their own stories um, and making them marginal is, in, uh, for me, indicative of a central aspect of American culture and psychology. So it's not too far-fetched to think that Hollywood does these things in the same way that America in general does it when it goes overseas and does its foreign policy yeah. and doesn't ask questions, for example. And so, you know, the, the, although it's a comic part of the novel, the satirization of the film and of Hollywood, it's also pretty serious because I make claims like Hollywood is, you know, our unofficial ministry of propaganda. We don't need an official one like the Soviets or the Chinese or the Nazis because American ideology is such that we don't need to force Hollywood to do these things. Hollywood willingly participates in, in American culture and American power. Well, and it, like from a creative artistic perspective, like, you know, you say you admire a film like Apocalypse Now from an artistic perspective, a technical perspective, as a, as a work of cinematic art, you can see the, the appeal, correct? Yes. But at the same time, there's this deficit and uh, this sort of uh, like papering over of the people of color and their experience. As a white auteur who is culturally sensitive... You know, let's say there's a director who's aware of this and would like to try to make a balanced film where there's, you know, uh, multiple viewpoints represented. I think sometimes, uh, like the the criticism could be, well, like what right do you have to speak on behalf of these people? Like that's not your experience. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like there could be an overstepping, whereas you can speak to the Vietnamese experience and the refugee experience mm -hmm. with like authority. Right. Like, do you think it's uh, okay? Do you think that like uh, people of different races or cultural backgrounds? should make a greater effort to extend themselves and to try to give voice to those things? Do you think they lack a certain authority? Like, I feel like I could see that being something that holds them back. Yeah, and obviously that's an important question. It goes to these issues of authenticity, who has the right to speak, and so on. I don't take a blanket position on it. I don't say that if you're white, you can't make work about some other culture, and vice versa, right? Yeah. I want to reserve the right to write my great 
urban novel about divorce in a New England town if I ever want to get to, to doing that. You know, but, uh, Achiever novel. Right. But I mean, I'll do my research. You yeah. know? And, but, but partially, you know, one of the things I say in the novel is if you're a person of color in American society, you've already done your research by dint of living here. You know, yeah, like the, yeah. By being exposed constantly to what white people think about themselves. Right. So – it's not that so let's say Hollywood. It's not that Hollywood can't do these kinds of things, but it's that Hollywood has often done them so badly that you wonder: Have they done their research, and have they actually addressed the way that they make movies so that they could try to at least get a little bit closer to? I don't know if authentic is the right word, but how about a better representation? What's like it? hire screenwriters, right. you know, hire actors, put them on, make at least make one of the stars a person of color from the culture you're talking about. Yeah. So there's between not doing something and exploiting something, there's this whole range of things in between that we often don't do. Right. Well, yeah. And I think it's like, there was the whole thing last year with the Oscars, like Oscar so white or whatever the hashtag was. And uh, it just struck me that like the, it's a systemic thing. It is systemic. And, and that's why, you know, it's, it, it's, it's important not to think about, a work of art, whether it's literature or film in these examples, simply as the work of art itself. Like, you know, we buy a book or we watch a movie and it's the, only the end product that matters, but it's the entire production chain. It's the entire industry, whether it's the literary industry or the cinematic industry that we need to pay attention to. And so there's other discussions have been happening in the last year or two about how the literary industry is 89% white. And I assume primarily upper class, upper middle class people, that inevitably is going to affect the books that we get at the end, right? So we can't only talk about the books. We need to talk about the entire industry, how they reflect, how they how they express inequalities that are deeply embedded in American society. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you have any ideas on what the solution is? I mean, like these big corporate publishers need to have imprints that are devoted to writers of color. They need to reallocate resources. Well, All I would say communism. <laughs> <laughs> Has some clues that, you know, I mean, seriously, I mean, like, we need actually to talk about systemic inequality throughout American society and how it impacts everything. So on the one hand, while we can say, yes, a particular industry needs to have pay its interns, needs to have affirmative action, these are just Band-Aid measures that can't really stem the flow of blood from a society that's that's weakened by inequality. So vote, vote Bernie Sanders, vote whatever you think. <laughs> Today, it's June 7th. It's California primary. Right. Too late for your, uh, your audience, perhaps. But, you know, there are, I mean, we really need to think about art and its location to society as a whole and that we can't change art without changing society. So let's go back to you arriving in America. You were born in Vietnam. Yes. Where in Vietnam? I was born in a little town called Ban Me Tuot, which is in the Central Highlands, and it's famous for coffee. So if you buy Uban today, it probably has beans from this area and famous for being the first town overrun in the final invasion of 1975 in our case the town was taken in march and that was about a month or six weeks before the final end of the country of the south vietnam and then when did your family decide that it was time to to flee well my dad was in saigon on business when the town was taken um, so the lines of communication were cut off so my mom had to make that decision and her decision was okay we're going to run right now and not knowing where my dad is and uh, not knowing what the future held, thinking that this would just be another seesaw battle as it had been in the past and that we would return home, she left my oldest sister, who was adopted behind to take care of the family business and house, took my older brother and myself, and we walked downhill a few hundred kilometers through a battle, uh, battle-torn uh, landscape. A few hundred kilometers? I think. My geography is bad, but it was long. I mean, I've driven that route uphill. It, it, it was days, not hours. I'm pretty sure it was days. By, 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 by car up the mountains, it was half a day of, of driving. So by foot through that war, yeah. it took a lot longer. And we made it to Nha Trang, which is the nearest port city, and took a, a, bo- a boat to Saigon. Fortunately, found my dad. And then there was yet another you know, terrible story to get out of Saigon as well. God. And what what about your uh, older sister and the family business? Like, did she get, get out too? No, she was 16. And the communists, when they took over, of course, took everything away and made her volunteer. That was a term for a youth brigade whose job was to go and re- help rebuild the country. You know, and then she came back and she was she found a husband, raised kids and everything. And I um, went to see her. I met her in Yajang in 2003. So that is about 28 years after I left. And, you know, the great joy of that was to find out that, 
you know, even though she had endured all these kinds kinds of things, and even though she was nowhere near as prosperous as my family had become, she was a person who, unlike everybody else in my family, knew how to have fun. <laughs> she looked good. She wore makeup. She was fashionable. And so that was actually, you know, one of the ironic outcomes of that history. And where does she live now? Same town? Or? Same town. Oh, wow. You know, which I've never been back to. But you're, you're like, when, when you guys parted ways, that was the last time you saw her until, until, until 2003? Yep. Wow. But, you know, my parents, my dad didn't see his relatives for 40 years. My mom didn't see her relatives for 20 years. And these stories of separation are really actually quite normal. That's what I was going to say. Like, this is the refugee experience. Fam- yeah. Families get torn apart. It's just commonplace. Yeah. Everybody I know has stories like this. Huh. And like most people who, uh, you know, have no real contact with this sort of uh, reality, that seems unfathomable. That's why I don't generally go around talking about it you know, at a cocktail party. What do you talk about it? People are like, oh, well, I don't, oh, sorry. You know? So it, it is unfathomable. I think, again, I think for many Americans, what's fathomable is the, when they think of this particular war, they obviously have some sense of what American soldiers have been through. And so even as difficult as it is for a lot of American soldiers to talk about their experience to civilians, at least the gist of their experience has been turned into movies and books and so on. But for most Americans, I think they have no understanding, recognition of uh, what happened to Vietnamese people of all kinds, but including the ones who made it to the United States. Until they read The Sympathizer. Well, let's hope. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, uh, Just uh, we're talking just a few days after Muhammad Ali died, and I've been seeing endless things about him on the internet and TV and reading in the, in the paper, and his stance on the Vietnam War back in the day, uh, really, aged, it's aged well. I it feel, has. you know, he's, I mean, a, yeah. he's a really special guy. And like the, some of the quotes from him, I don't know. I don't know everything about it, but I just found myself moved by the things he was saying back then, which yeah. made him very unpopular with a lot of people. I think it was six, 1965 when he refused the draft. Was that, or was it 67? I can't remember the exact, if very, fairly early on. So if it was 67, this was, you know, before 1968, the Tet Offensive, when things really went south for uh, the American public opinion, which actually supported the war before 1968. So his, his stance to refuse to be drafted was extremely unpopular. It's of the same decision that made Martin Luther King Jr. in 1967 deliver a speech about Vietnam saying we shouldn't be there and connecting the experience that, you know, poor people of color, black and Latino men in particular, you know, are suffering here in the United States and yet they're being drafted and sent to fight this war that's that in in King's opinion and, and Muhammad Ali's opinion was racist against Vietnamese and other Asian people. So they were uh, really at the forefront of radical black consciousness. And you have to understand that there were a lot of African Americans besides other Americans who didn't support this position. They said, you know, we should focus on civil rights domestically in the US. And Muhammad Ali and Martin Luther King Jr. were saying, no, we need to be International. It was globalizing. It's globalizing, it. right? Mm. And the the only the good thing about this uh, is, you know, about Muhammad Ali, he stood up for what was right, and he was validated, which should be a, a you know a clarion call for all of us. Yeah. To heed, you know, our genuine beliefs. That it's are a good. It's a inside. good lesson. You know, yeah. it's weird with like political courage, or if that's what you want to call it, courage just generally, but courage of one's convictions, or um, like you said, the courage to stand up for one's deepest beliefs. It can be hard, like to have clarity. And to then be willing to speak and to take a stand. I think there's a tendency on my part sometimes to be like, am I right? I, I, I wobble. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think watching that makes me want to do, that, do less of that. Do you know what I'm saying? Watching those old clips of Muhammad Ali, reading those quotes, seeing the fact that he was willing to stand makes me want to do the same. Yeah. And, and then I, hopefully you're right. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you're right, right? You know, you could, you could take you have the courage of your convictions like the governor of Alabama. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, oh. Ended up on the wrong side. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you hope you're right. You hope that your moral and political consciousness is right. Your ethical sense is good, and it's rare. You know, it's rare in athletics. Obviously, he still stands out today. Yeah. It's relatively rare in literature. You know that we have writers who speak truth to power. Uh, we. I, I wonder what your opinion is about this. I just had this conversation the other day, but you know, we look at other countries like China, for example, and, and whenever a writer stands up as a dissident, we say, "Of course, that's what writers should do." Yeah. And then I think in the United States, what does it mean to be a dissident? What What is it that we're supposed to stand up against? Are we? Do we have political writers? Do we have a political literature? Every once in a while, there's like you know a group letter signed, like the undersigned, and it's like 500 writers who put their name on a thing, which just, is, which isn't nothing, but it's not. It seems uh, less involved. There's just, less risk involved. I just did that for the – there was a letter about Donald Trump. Did you, yeah. did you see this one, right? And so I did that um, 
knowing exactly what you're saying, right? But you know, I think Alexander Heyman wrote a response saying, well, I didn't sign this because this is exactly what you're saying. Not much of a response. And where's, where's, where's American literature as a whole in terms of its political stance? So that's something that's always on my mind because I, I, I do think that we need a political literature. I do think we need writers to be political in their everyday lives, but also just in writing books, what they do best. And I wonder, do we do that? Heyman doesn't think so. The guy who runs the Nobel Prizes doesn't think so, as he slammed American literature a few years ago. And But then the nationalist, I mean, sort of like prickles and saying, well, is Heyman right? Is the Nobel Prize right? Depends who we're looking at in terms of American literature. Um, if we look at the literature of like people of color in the United States, there's been a lot of political commitment. But the tendency is not to see that as American literature as a whole. All right, there we go. That was a flashback to episode 419, my conversation with Pulitzer Prize winner Viet Thanh Nguyen. The episode first aired on June 22nd, 2016. If you would like to listen to episode 419 in its entirety, you can do so. It is in the feed. It is in the podcast feed. Track it down, episode 419. All episodes of this show are available to listeners. You can find Viet Thanh Nguyen on the internet at vietwin.info. He is also on Facebook, Goodreads, and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. Follow the show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter, and Blue Sky. Join the Other People Patreon community. Sign up for the email newsletter over at otherppl.com or bradlisty.com. It's once a week. It's free. If you have a couple of minutes and you would be so kind, I would appreciate it if you would give this show a rating wherever you listen. If you can write a review, if that's an option, that would be great. It helps new listeners find the show. If you would like to get an Other People t-shirt, you can do that at otherppl.com. And finally, a quick plug for my latest novel. It is called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything, available now in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook, so I'll read it to you if you want. It's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. So, coming up on Sunday, I will be in conversation with Eden Lepaki, who is making her triumphant return to the show after I believe 12 years it's been a minute she has a new novel out called Time's Mouth which is available from Counterpoint so stay tuned